So, in our last class, you've seen how we can use the chocolate and prey classification to determine what porosities we have in carbonate rocks. You've also seen that this classification is genetic and it gives us information on where the porosity comes from. But we've also said that we cannot predict permeability only based on chocolate and prey. We need more than that in carbonates. And that leads us to rock typing and permeability prediction. Okay, well, welcome to Texas. We are at Last Chance Canyon. The rocks behind me are Permian in H. It's the San Andreas Formation. And that really brings me back because these are some of the first outcrops I've used to teach in the field when I joined Imperial College. So absolutely spectacular geology. And there's a particular reason I'm bringing you to these Permian rock in Texas today. It's because their history and the history of how we predict permeability in a subsurface in carbonate reservoir are sort of linked through a key publication. So the challenge that we have in carbonate, again, is the fact that we have different grain shapes and different grain sizes. And the fact that we have different shapes and sizes makes the pore network, the porosity if you want, or the pore network, very complicated and hard to predict. Whereas in clastic, it's relatively easy to predict the maximum porosity and from this to predict a, a, an average permeability thanks to the fact that we know the geometry and the size of the pore throat size, of course, can be more complicated. In carbonates, it's incredibly difficult and it needs to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. So let's look at how we can do this. And let's first look at the pore types that we find in petrophysical classification, because this is what is this is going to be about. It's going to be about petrophysics. So in terms of pore types, we can recognize intergrade and intercrystal pore types. That's kind of the same thing, if you want, in terms of how they would behave in, in terms of petrophysics. Then in the middle, we have moldic, intrafossil, or shelter porosity that are relatively isolated and that need to go through the matrix. And finally, we have these very large pores like cavernous fracture, solution large, enlarged fractures, etc. So now we can superimpose on that our chocolate and prey classification. And you can see that fabric selective um, porosities in this classification correspond to the, to the first two categories, whereas non fabric selective uh, porosity correspond to the last category. The very first petrophysical classification came in 1952 by Archie. And Archie recognized that in carbonates, in order to be able to predict permeability from, from uh, porosity, you had to go to a system where you would basically separate the matrix from what is not the matrix. So VOGS. Essentially, what Archie called non-matrix is VOGS. Any types of non-matrix porosity in Archie's classification is called a VOG. And then he would classify them as VOG of type A, B, C, and D, depending on their size and their distribution. The logic behind this is that if you have matrix porosity, you have a flow through that matrix that is relatively even. The VOGS, however, need to flow through the matrix to produce, produce permeability unless they're connected. And this basic idea was pushed forward by Jerry Lucia in a few key publications. And the first one is in 1983. And there he recognized that you had matrix, uh, matrix porosity that could be called interparticle porosity. So be careful because the terminology is very mixed up between Lucia and Chocolate and Prey. In this case, interparticle in the Lucia classification includes, includes intergrain and intercrystals. And Lucia also recognized that everything else would be called a VOG. So just like Archie, he calls everything a VOG that is not matrix permeability. And it's not the same definition 
as the Vogue in chocolate and Pray. So be very careful about this. And he, he made an important distinction with the Vogue. He said there are two types of Vogue. Either they're separate, and so the flow needs to go through the matrix, and that will basically reduce permeability because matrix typically has small pore throat sizes, or those Vogues are touching, in which case the fluid, whether it's water or oil or gas, can flow straight through. And what's interesting about the Lucia classification is that it was developed based on rock from the Permian Basin of Texas. So we are right here in the Permian Basin, and this is where this classification came from. That's why I selected this particular outcrop for this class today. So let's look at how his classification works. So the first thing to realize is that this is a, an empirical classification or an empirical schema. What Lucia observed when he looked at porosity versus permeability is that if you plot the mercury or air extrapolated displacement pressure, so in other words, the permeability on a vertical axis versus the average particle size of the rock, in the Permian Basin, you obtain this curve, and there seems to be two inflection points to that curve, one at 20 micron and one at 100 micron. So in Lucia's mind, these 20 and 100 micron became key sizes that would predict how the different classes would um, behave in terms of porosity versus permeability. And he came up with these three petrophysical classes based on that. So you have one class that is uh, where the grains are large, smaller than 20 micron, one class where the grains are between 20 and 100 micron, and one when the grains are basically between 500 to 100 micron. And you can clearly see that if you do this, the relationship between porosity and permeability becomes relatively well defined for each petrophysical classes. And that's really, what he wanted. He wanted to be able to look at the rock, determine the class, measure the porosity, predict the permeability. And that seems to work in this case.